This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. The historian Will Durant once said a man's dealing with his God should be a sacred thing, inviolable by any potentate. No ruler has yet existed who was wise enough to instruct a saint. And a good man who is not great is a hundred times more precious than a great man who is not good. And Mahatma Gandhi wrote, to try to root out religion from society is a wild goose chase. And were such an attempt to succeed, it would mean the destruction of society. The existence of the world, in a broad sense, depends upon religion. Believing in God or not believing in God is more than a matter of merely having a proposition of philosophy proven or not proven logically. It is a matter of personal choice. Years ago, the astronaut Eugene Cernan, commander of the Apollo 10 moon flight, commented after the flight, I know there is something bigger than us behind all of this because of what I saw and what I felt on the flight. That's probably the biggest impact on my way of thinking that has happened to me in the space program. Another astronaut, Alan Shepard, the fifth man to step out upon the moon, wrote later, when you back away from the Earth and look at it, you realize it's only a pinpoint in the universe. You want to tell people to visualize how big the universe is and how futile it is to get involved in squabbles on our small spaceship Earth. Modern humankind urgently need a larger perspective. Yet another astronaut, John Irwin, described his voyage to the moon as truly a religious experience. And he dedicated his life thereafter to teaching humankind that his personal faith in God was vitalized by his space flight to the moon. This is a vast and mighty universe in which we live. And there's a purpose to it all which few mortals in their lifetimes have ever so much as begun to glimpse. Our small blue planet, its oceans shimmering in sunlight, hangs like a silent star sapphire in space, suspended on the unseen pendant of universe gravity. And here it is that multiplied millions have been born, lived their lifetimes, and died for century following century. Yet so few have beheld it all from this larger perspective, that we and our world are a part and a meaningful part of a great and grand divine design that there is a higher plan and purpose to it all, that there exists in the infinite mind of the infinite God a reason for this earth and for your very human life here on this earth. For there smolders a glow within your soul, a burning ember of eternity, the living presence of the everlasting, the spiritual reality of the God who is the architect of time and space, the God who loves you with a love which will not let you go, which surrounds you, which is within you, which envelops you and a forgiveness and a newness of life available for you if you will have the faith this moment to claim it. Your sonship or daughterhood with God, the kingdom of God is within you, and the God who is the source of all reality has a will for your life and an eternal will for your eternal life, for there is more beyond. But you must choose to claim these things for your own, only in this fashion, by the consecrated spiritual decision of individual human beings can this world become what it was created to be. For there is dawning across our planet a great spiritual awakening, a new era of love, of peace, justice, and truth. But it must begin, and indeed it can only begin, in the minds and the souls of individual men and women. People, people like you, whose lives can become committed to love and peace and justice and to truth. In short, it must begin really, truly with you, the individual. There are, of course, the skeptics, those who argue that religion is a highly inaccurate form of knowledge, who remind humankind that scholars have found there is not, nor has there ever been, a complete printed Bible without any typographical errors in it, and that, in addition, there is much scholastic debate over the precise meanings of countless lines and passages of scriptures. This is a critical distinction. Jesus called humankind to living spiritual truth, not to legalistic scriptural argumentation. There were, after all, 613 religious laws which a righteous adherent to the Hebrew faith was supposed to follow in Jesus' own lifetime. But never once did Jesus preach on those 613 rules. Instead, he called his crowds to two supreme loyalties, the love of God 
and the love of human beings. When once accused of violating the traditional law by breaking and eating grain on the Sabbath, Jesus replied, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus became quite specific about this. He once remarked that many who went around saying, Lord, Lord, and using religious or scriptural or theological language would not enter into the kingdom of heaven because scriptural language and religious vocabulary are simply not the important things. These are not the criteria. These were not what Jesus was talking about. What he was talking about was the spiritual truth that you can find and come to know the living God, that if you would but dare to believe it, you are a son or daughter of the infinite, of the eternal father of all beings who loves you with an everlasting love, whom you can come to know better and better through all of eternity, beginning right here and now. If you will give yourself to that, to the simple love of God, and the love of others. Not a dreary duty, but an exaltation of the soul to know you're loved and to let that love course and surge through your personality into the lives of others and ultimately to God in worship and in praise. Humankind can never be ultimately satisfied with anything but the ultimate. For each one of us possesses yearnings for realities beyond the stars. We have a need for God. Not merely the memorization of theories and theologies or philosophies or doctrines about God, but the knowing of God as a friend in an interpersonal sense which can animate your life. Ordinarily, we thank a person for something after we have received it, but faith the sort of faith of which I'm speaking, is in a way thanking God in advance for what you are going to receive. Faith is living expectantly as a child of God, continually giving gratitude to the Father for God's love and for His goodness and forgiveness. And such faith as this brings good things to pass in your life. It energizes your mind, your soul, your body, your very being to a new way of living, living spiritually. It's transforming. I remember a man told me one time about the first prayer which he had ever prayed in his life. He said he never forgot it. He'd gone through his childhood and his adolescent years, early manhood, never once really having prayed. But he said one noontime he was sitting at work over his lunch break. He was tired, he was disgusted, distraught. And as he sat there eating lunch, he said, whispered to himself in desperation, God, help me to meet my problems. Give me strength. He said, and I wrote down the words he used, quote, and something happened to me that had never happened to me before. He said his problems no longer looked like the Himalayan mountains to him. That doesn't mean they dried up like tumbleweeds and went blowing away across the prairie either, but they took on a different perspective. And that is one of the amazing results of prayer, if you pray in faith. If you don't pray in faith, you're not really praying so much as you're worrying on your knees or having an anxiety attack when in a religious posture. No, share your life simply and earnestly with God as a child with the Father through prayer you will make the transition from saying, oh God, what a great problem I have, to saying to your problems, oh problem, what a great God I have. God loves you. And if you learn nothing else but that, that this great compassion, this affection, this forgiveness surges through the universe and into your soul, and if you'll feelingly experience that, you'll discover that the teachings of Jesus are not restrictions and spiritual straitjackets, but truth, liquid liberties, love, joy. In an age of get it in writing or people won't keep their promises, do to others before they do to you, or believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see, and the, quote, credibility gap, Jesus of Nazareth called humankind to faith and to trust in God. If there be only one truly trustworthy being in all the universe in your philosophy, it would certainly have to be God, the creator, the author of it all, the controller, the upholder of all that is. According to Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion, action and reaction are equal and opposite. 
For each and every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if a floor will bear 200 pounds of weight, what does that mean? It means that floor can meet 200 pounds of downward force with 200 pounds of upward force. So too it is with faith. The more you put the whole weight of your faith, of your life upon God, the more you will discover the faithfulness of God, the more you will find God deserving of your faith and of your trust. The more you give to God, the more you will become glad to give to God because your cup will be running over with joy, with faith. You may not have everything material that someone might want, but you'll have peace of heart, peace of mind and soul, and live in love for God and love for others. That illumines human life. One of the author Robert Louis Stevenson's poems reflects one of his delightful childhood memories. It seems that he loved to sit on winter evenings and watch for the lamplighter making his way up the hill. Lantern in hand, that humble workman would move through the deepening shadows, climbing his ladder at every lamp post. A taper would glow, the lamp was lighted, and another circle of light reached out to pierce the gloom of the night. This young boy's great thrill came when the lamplighter paused and gave the lad a friendly smile of greeting. But listen to those lines of his poem, The Lamplighter, which quote young Robert Louis Stevenson's resolve. But I, when I am stronger and can choose what I'm to do, I'll go around at night and light the many lamps with you. Be a source of light and of life to the world. Love God and love people. Believe in the family of God as a dream, as an ideal, as a reality, that this world is a family, that all the sometimes warring and petulant and hurting races and nations and the divisions were born to live in peace. But there can only be peace on earth when there is goodwill among humankind, among people. And that begins with you and that begins with me. That's where the spiritual renaissance begins. That's why we call this the spiritual renaissance broadcast. But it begins in your life. Your life as a son or daughter of God. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day. <laughs>